it's not only about buying the vaccines, uh, it's also important to think about how to vaccinate people, how to deliver the vaccines in countries, including logistics. Hello and welcome to Expert Answers, I'm Paul Blake. Today we're talking about COVID-19 vaccines, and in particular, we're talking about the $12 billion in support that the World Bank Group is making available to countries to help them finance the purchase and distribution of these vaccines, as well as COVID-19 tests and treatments. To learn more about this effort, I recently spoke to the World Bank's Global Director for Health, Nutrition, and Population, Dr. Mohamed Pate. So Mohammed, let's start with the headline, $12 billion in support being made available to developing countries to help them uh, with the COVID-19 vaccines and testing and treatment. Can you talk to me a little bit about how that money will be used? And, and I know we've, we've had a lot of news here in the past few days about vaccines, but as I understand, none of them have been approved, at least here as of sort of middle of November. Are you waiting for an approval or can you start laying that groundwork for that vaccine rollout today? So the recently announced $12 billion is additional financing on the back of the $6 billion that the bank announced earlier in the pandemic, in March, April period, which is to help countries deal with the emergency response, strengthen their health systems, and prepare for rebuilding at the end of the pandemic period. But it anticipated that vaccines and therapeutics will become available. So once the development of vaccines progressed, the bank's board and the bank's leadership then approved this $12 billion to enable countries to have access to the vaccine when the vaccines become available, because at the moment there is no vaccine, and to deliver those vaccines, because it's not only about buying the vaccines, uh, it's also important to think about how to vaccinate people, how to deliver the vaccines in countries, including the logistics and the delivery to the human being to be, so that they can be protected from uh, the virus uh, that has caused the pandemic. And, and to the layman like myself, you know, as I've just been reading the reports in, in the news media, the two big challenges that stand out to me is the logistics of getting these vaccines to people. They have to be kept at very cold temperatures, I think. And then they also have to be given in, the, the, at least the ones we know about today, they have to be given in sort of two doses at a very specific time. Can you explain that a little bit to, to the layman like myself and, and why that's so challenging, um, especially for developing countries? So, so there, there, there are hundreds of vaccines in development, but some are in the front line. They are much closer. So there are 10 or 11 vaccines that are really frontliners. And more recently, we've had two where we have seen data that shows that they, they are efficacious. Unfortunately, those two are ones that use the technology that is different than what we traditionally used for vaccine development. And therefore, they require new ways of uh, keeping the vaccines uh, really potent. And that is the cold chain infrastructure. That is a higher degree than what we have required for other vaccines. And that complicates the story because many countries in the world don't have access to those ultra cold chain equipment. Not to say that this will be the only vaccines. There may be other vaccines that will come behind them that may have similar levels of efficacy or slightly lower, but require lesser stringent cold chain infrastructure. Now, the bank's financing is geared towards supporting countries to improve on their cold chain infrastructure. That means assessing the gaps, and if countries choose to use the financing from the bank, they can acquire some of those technologies to enable them. And the, the two, you, the, the, the sort of front of the race uh, vaccines that we've been reading about here in the past few days and few weeks, those and, and some of the others we've been reading about, they're being developed by companies in developed countries. That might lead some people to say, well, those countries, those developed countries where many of these vaccines are, are you know, the research is being done, the, the, the immediate research is being done, those, sh those countries should have priority access. What would you say to people who, who might believe that? COVID-19 started in one country, but it rapidly moved to affect the entire global community. I think it's one instance where we no country can be really safe by protecting only its own population while the rest of the world is uh, not uh, protected. What does that really mean? So I think it's, it's 
important that we approach the issue of vaccines uh, from the land, from the point of view that uh, we're all in it together, and that we should have fair allocation mechanism uh, for distribution of those vaccines, acknowledging that the uh, there's a combination of inputs. So take for instance, the vaccine itself was rapidly sequenced. It was sequenced in one country. Other countries got access to it. The technologies are distributed across borders. And even the clinical trials for those vaccines, even if they are developed, if they are, uh, the vaccines were developed in high income countries, there are lots of clinical trials that are happening in the developing world as well. And finally, to reopen the global economy, you can't just reopen one country and think that that is it. We are an interconnected uh, global ecosystem that what happens in one country affects another country. So to reopen the global economy, all countries across the globe must be able to have their frontline workers, their uh, service providers up and running so that the benefit, the full benefit of the vaccinations, of vaccines in fact, can be uh, felt across the world. It wouldn't happen if you only have a handful of countries. It would be an unfortunate situation also, just ethically and I think morally, if you have a situation whereby you've got two track uh, sets of countries, one, can, one set of countries that actually have the vaccines and then another set of countries that actually don't have it. I think that's not the kind of world that we would be uh, very comfortable uh, to see unfold. There's been a, a global pandemic that's had a global economy and there's been this global effort to respond to it. You're making the case there for, for the equitable, equitable distribution across countries. Talk to me a little bit about what equitable distribution looks like within countries. I think importantly, reciprocity is a very important principle to have in mind. Those who have the highest burden should have the first call on the vaccines. So frontline health workers should be in the first line. Uh, frontline service providers that should also be in the first line. And those who have uh, at highest risk, the elderly and those with comorbid conditions should also be prioritized. I, th I think that's sort of the focus of uh, the, the bank support around countries, that the countries have policies in place that deal with the allocation within them. But another key challenge that I've been reading about is the idea of misinformation, rumor, disinformation. Talk to me about why that's such a challenge and, and what the World Bank is doing to try to combat some of that. So with, with democratization of information and multiple channels out there, I think we will get all kinds of information, some of which are vetted, some of which are not. And there are also actors that really don't believe in the power of vaccines. Even though we've seen vaccines get rid of smallpox, almost on the verge of getting rid of polio and have led to unprecedented decline in child mortality. So vaccines work. And, and they, we say they're effective, that in fact they're effective and the data is available, has been seen, has been reviewed in a very transparent manner. That is how to engender that trust. And so we build that in the context of the World Bank support countries. There's a component on risk communication and community engagement so that we support countries to organize stakeholders within them and to discuss with their citizens on the issues as they emerge and convey the right information so that people believe that in fact what we say is it is, it is, it is, it is what we say. Well, Dr. Mohamed Pate, thank you so much for taking the time today. Thank you, Paul. Dr. Mohamed Pate is the World Bank's Global Director for Health, Nutrition and Population. He joined us from his home in the Washington DC area. And Dr. Pate is actually the former Minister of State for Health in Nigeria. He was on Expert Answers back at the beginning of the year and really helped us understand the gravity of the situation at hand when it comes to COVID. We'll be sure to check back with him over the coming months as the situation develops. In the meantime, if you want to learn more about what the World Bank Group is doing to help countries combat the pandemic, head on over to worldbank.org forward slash coronavirus. Thanks so much for subscribing. We'll see you back here again soon. Goodbye.